Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organization issues and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about the importance of public media with guests. Lindsay Beerman, CEO of UNCTV in North Carolina. Uh, Tim Fallon, CEO of PBS 39 in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. And Joshua Adams, station manager of Houston Public Media in Houston, Texas. So thank you all for joining us. It is so wonderful to see you. We've collaborated on a number of occasions, uh, uh, Lindsay and uh, Tim and, and Joshua, Hope Springs Eternal. And, and <laughs> I'm so happy, I'm so happy to uh, be able to talk about public media because we're trying in our efforts to emulate your efforts. So uh, let's start off, uh, Joshua, um, talk about Houston Public Media and the services that you provide and how those services are unique to your broadcast area. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, absolutely. And thank, thank you for having me. This is a, you know, it's exciting. Anytime you get an opportunity to talk about public media, uh, to talk about PBS um, in Houston, uh, we're licensed to the University of Houston, along with an NPR radio station. So we have the, the, the joy of being a joint licensee, um, you know, and really uh, the, the pandemic uh, and the stay at home working has helped us really focus in our organization, uh, our commitment to the community, uh, be that through news uh, that we bring folks on radio uh, and digital, be that arts coverage. We've expanded uh, both uh, our PBS arts programming, but also our relationships with uh, the Houston Symphony, with the, uh, with the opera, uh, to put those, those over the radio. Um, and then education, you know, our commitment through PBS Learning Media has really blossomed in a way that um, has helped, you know, I believe parents uh, at home have a resource to go to. Um, you know, we pivoted our entire education team from what they were doing and said, do nothing else but make these at-home resources available. All of those regional teams joined together uh, and, and literally linked up curriculum with programs. Uh, so we really felt like we were super serving the community. And that's, that's really the goal of public media is to super serve the community. And you recognize the tra traumatic time that we're in. So you're bringing people together and you're, you're collaborating in somewhat unaccustomed ways, but is the most natural way in the world because you are public media. Lindsay, you also have this huge territory to, to, to cover. You are UNCTV, but you really cover the entire state, don't you? Yes, we do. Um, it is, thank you, for, thank you for having me today. And uh, it's great to be here. We, UNCTV was founded in 1955 as the University of North Carolina Educational Television. And that was probably, I think, 15 years before PBS was launched. So we were a pioneer in education uh, and it was the vision of uh, UNC President Bill Friday. And it is core to our mission today. Uh, we have four, four broadcast channels uh, in addition to social media platforms as well as YouTube uh, and, other, and other digital platforms. But uh, we have recently, uh, in the pandemic, like many PBS stations, we have partnered with the state's uh, Department of Public Instruction and have dedicated one of our four broadcast channels entirely to at-home learning. Uh, so we're very proud of that work uh, and very proud of the work of that our colleagues across the nation have been doing to serve uh, our most vulnerable youth. Uh, we also uh, have been <coughs> uh, embedded in the Governor's Emergency Operations Center. So as the backbone for the state's emergency communications, uh, we've been providing bilingual uh, Spanish and English briefings uh, daily uh, as needed, and uh, also have a weekly 30-minute interview with uh, the state's um, health director, who is a trusted source of information during a time of so much misinformation. So um, we're very proud of that work as well. The thing that I think that's so interesting about uh, when you summarize your work, and of course you're also doing things like rebroadcasting content from other places, but this idea of covering um, not the political side so much, but the governmental side, um, and making sure that people are connected to what is going on in the legislature um, that affects their lives. The whole idea of providing uh, educational outreach, the whole idea of binding the state together, all these kinds of things are not going to be the kinds of things that commercial entities are necessarily going to be positioned to do 
crypto immediately because there's high expense and low return. Right, Tim? I mean, when, when you're talking about helping this, this um, economic juggernaut that the Lehigh Valley that had, had fallen on some difficult times with the removal of the steel industry as, as uh, competition went global, and now there's this re-blossoming, this, this real vitality about the Lehigh Valley that has always been in its core, you're actually being an economic driver, although you are a nonprofit. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Thanks, uh, Mark. And again, thank you for, uh, for having us uh, be part of this. Uh, actually, you just you know, triggered a, 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 a nice thought about that. Uh, last week, we had the, um, uh, we used the OVO, uh, or OV rather, platform to do um, a presentation of a documentary that we had done on Bethlehem Steel. And one of our former board members uh, was the last CEO of Bethlehem Steel. And he joined that conversation with the head of the Economic Development Corporation, Don Cunningham. Uh, we actually broke the platform. Uh, we had more participants. It was over a thousand participants. They were only set up to, they've never had anything approaching a thousand participants uh, on this particular platform. So it was a wonderful uh, ex uh, explanation of, of the value that uh, Bethlehem Steel had and public media in uh, working with our economic development folks to, to really share the message of uh, what a great community uh, we, we were and will be in the future as, uh, as we go forward. Just wanted to touch on <clears throat> what uh, Lindsay and Joshua were both mentioning, and I think it's throughout the, uh, the United States that public media stations have engaged uh, in, in a much more robust manner with their departments of education. Uh, we recently were awarded $11.5 million uh, to support two different initiatives that we're working on with the Department of Education. One is called Learning at Home, which is very similar to uh, what Lindsay was just sharing with the, uh, uh, the Learning Channel. Uh, and we're also standing up a new pilot program called Data Casting. Uh, which is where we're utilizing some of our broadcast uh, bandwidth to send one-way uh, internet connectivity uh, to places that don't, uh, don't have internet access. And so for those students who can't go to school, uh, but they, they have a television set, we'll be able to reach them with uh, content. Uh, and we're, uh, we have colleagues in South Carolina, Indiana, and the Virgin Islands who are also setting up uh, similar uh, uh, pilots just like this as well. So great uh, public-private uh, non-commercial partnerships uh, uh, evolving from this. It's so interesting. We just finished a poll in which we asked whether locally produced or nationally produced uh, uh, programs um, were the predominant reasons for people to view. And the resounding answer is yes. 50% people say locally produced programs are the most important reason to watch them. 50% people said that nationally and internationally produced programs. And that's, that's a real tribute to public media, this whole idea of being both local and national, international. The other thing that I think is so interesting about all answers here is that you actually provide the lubrication in the market for doing things quickly that are just in the public interest. So when, when you all, it would be great to, to talk with you about how you develop your content, how you develop your programming. How do you, how do, you do that? Is it a unitary thing? Are you looking at what can advertise and get you the most money, which is, you know, any commercially oriented organization has to think about income, income, what's gonna attract attention. How do you do it um, in, in the non-commercial space? Uh, Lindsay, let's start with let's start with you, and then um, and then we'll go around to Tim, and then Joshua. So, in an ideal world, I would have a two hundred million dollar endowment to fund content production. That would be wonderful. So, if anybody out there wants to provide that, uh, call me. Um, <laughs> content production funding is enormously challenging, uh, it's particularly when. Um, uh, Corporate, given all of the economic uncertainties, uh, it, it, it has been difficult to find. That said, uh, we recently uh, launched a new program and have become uh, we're very excited about uh, PBS Terra Channel. And um, UNCTV has a, a program called Overview on the Terra Channel. 
And that was a combination of private support, uh, some funding from CPB uh, and other sources, but primarily private support uh, to, to, um, to develop and launch this program, which uh, highlights environmental issues uh, across the United States uh, through drone cinematography primarily. So the first episode that launched was about why, how the Blue Ridge almost lost their blue. And it was, I learned, like I do from everything on our, on PBS, I learned something that I, I that I didn't know I didn't know. Uh, and it was about how um, air pollution coming from surrounding states was really uh, creating a serious health hazard and changing, uh, impacting the air quality in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina and changing changing them from blue to this white haze, all of which has been corrected. And uh, But we'll be doing more programming like that. Uh, similarly, with, with local programming, we get significant funding from Visit NC because they recognize and have acknowledged many times that our program, North Carolina Weekend, drives uh, tourism across the state. So we've heard that anecdotally over and over again. And if you think about a program uh, we were the presenting station for a very highly rated program, the Chef's Life, and um, uh, along with um, South Carolina, uh, and then somewhere south. And uh, Kinston, North Carolina, is now on the national culinary map as a result of that program, a Chef's Life, uh, and that is directly related to the power of local television. So we're we're actually coming into these local environments. If if I have never visited. North Carolina, I can have access to North Carolina culture. If I have never visited Lehigh Valley, I can have access to what is going on in Lehigh Valley, can't I, Tim? Absolutely, and uh, a quick shout out to Lindsay there. Um, having been to that restaurant in Kinston, North Carolina, it's worth the trip. Uh, uh, as Michael so Jordan, many. right? Kinston, North Carolina. Uh, very close. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, but yes, this is how we we bring our communities to the rest of the world. Uh, so whether uh, we have the good fortune to uh, be the national uh, presenting station for a, a show called Articulate, uh, and it is very generously funded by the Neubauer Fam uh, Family Foundation. So that is a, a, a traditional uh, uh, method of, of funding uh, a rather uh, expensive and very valuable uh, program. And we also get to uh, tag that uh, with things that relate to the Lehigh Valley. And actually we're encouraging uh, Discover Lehigh Valley to be engaged with that show as an opportunity to showcase uh, just what we have uh, to, to bring to the rest of the, uh, of the world. Given that we now live in our dining rooms uh, from, uh, from a work standpoint, uh, we need to live vicariously through the opportunities uh, that public media presents, uh, whether it's you know, Rick Steves, uh, great travel programs, or the wonderful locally produced uh, programs that, uh, that each of our uh, stations do. We actually uh, last year did over 500 hours of local, uh, pr locally produced programming. So our community uh, supports it, and therefore we're able to fund it uh, to uh, have that quantity and quality of, uh, of local programming. And Joshua, Houston is one of the most diverse uh, uh, cities in the world, and certainly in the United States. You also have this enormous geographic area. You have a very diversified economy. So you have yeah. a lot of different uh, interests and a lot of different issues that micro communities within the Houston environs um, face. How do you deal with that kind of complexity? You're the big dog here, but you also have quite a big challenge to climb every day. Yeah, you know, you can, you can I think, look at it as a challenge and frequently it is, but it is mostly an opportunity uh, because with that diverse, you know, just the myriad of diverse communities and their geographic diversity, their socioeconomic diversity, Obviously, the, the, um, you know, the demographics is, is very diverse as well. But the great thing about Houston is that everybody wants to know what's going on in Houston. So maybe you're telling the story of something that's happening in the energy market. Everyone cares. Maybe you're telling a story about something that's happening, you know, with food and culture. Well, everybody cares. Maybe you're talking about transportation or education. Everybody cares. And so it really it just 
it broadens or expands the table um, that of, of what you can bring forward to be a part of your local content, be that through television, through radio, through, through the digital offerings. You know, you sort of set this part of the conversation up asking about how do you program for that? You know, at our organization, you know, one of the things that we always say, and you can hopefully ask anybody in my organization and programming and they'll give you the same answer. Why did you pick that show? Why are you advocating for that show? And what they'll say is, because I think it'll serve our community better. And then you can measure that. Well, how do you measure it? Well, you measure it through ratings. You know, ratings can be a measure of how many eyeballs are gonna see this, you know, see this uh, underwriting or see this opportunity and that brings in dollars. But that model is really, really built for commercial. The model that we sort of use is the same data, but it's a measure of efficiency and impact in the community. So if we run a show and it gets a pretty good rating, we're able to go, that's how many people we touched. Now, fundraisers, go take that and talk about that impact in the community. Uh, because you have to remember when you're talking about a public media station, we're spending donor dollars. We're not getting money from you know, the network. We're not getting money from the university. We are using donor dollars. So whether you give us $5 or whether you give us $500,000, if you ask me how I spent your money, I need to have an answer that's better than, well, the ratings were good, so we ran it. Um, you know, and I just see that as a duty of being a steward of those donor dollars in the community. And we really try to push that onto everybody that impacts programming. And that can be our own internal folks who are producing and developing shows. It can be the vendors with whom we work to bring us content, uh, or it can be the programmers with whom we work that help us pick and select, well, you know, this one got a great rating, but this one seems like a better fit. Okay, what's really at stake here with, you know, a half a rating point here or there. Let's pick the one that helps really super serve the community because that's a better message to take out, uh, you know, with your marketing folks, with your donor folks, your fundraising folks. How do you all maintain balance so that you end up with, and, and, and Joshua, if you can jump in uh, first uh, in this one, how do you maintain balance when you're, when you're trying to um, ensure that um, you are addressing the various needs but we are famously in a very polarized society, right? So e even non-political decisions as to what you cover uh, suddenly become a, you know, why are you covering, uh, you know, just, just the thing that I said before the show, please everybody mask up even if you don't believe it, just to give everybody peace of mind and it might save a life. You know, that could be seen as a political statement. I just think it's, I mean, my own view is that it's just being nice, right? And considerate. Um, how do you deal with that? How do you make sure that you remain in the center, Joshua? So in our newsroom, uh, we stick to our we stick to our standards. You know, we we follow NPR and PBS's ethical standards for news coverage. And as long as you stick to that, and you stick to facts, and you stick to both sides, you know, you're never going to be able to take the politics out of it. But politics aren't facts most of the time. You stick to the facts. You're able you're able to defend that. Um, and, and I say defend, defend if people push back on it. Oh, you said wear a mask. Well, you know, this is what the data shows. This is what the data proves. Um, I think that the other piece of it, though, that, that's important is that, you know, and look, we're, we're, we're a famously sort of the perception is we are a liberal, a more liberal organization because of the news we do and our affiliation with NPR. We're in a fairly liberal city in the heart of a red state. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big, big mix. Um, you know, one of the things that we have actively been doing for several years um, is inviting seated elected officials to come talk to their constituents. Uh, we do it on one of our talk shows, congressmen, senators, local politicians, and we say, we want you to come for an hour and we want you to talk about the things you're doing, the bills that you are putting in, the, the, the items that you're supporting or the things that you want your constituents to know. And really the only sort of rules we place on it are that you can't campaign. You know, if you are running for reelection, you got to get elected before you can come back. We don't do it inside certain windows because we don't want to, you know, we, we want to be, we want to be clear about the election process and cycle, uh, but it's actually proven to be great. And we get a ton of feedback. Why'd you put that person on? You know, they were talking about X, Y, Z, and that's not what I expect from my station. Well, you know what? We're here to serve the community and the community elected this person so we're here to let them speak to their constituents. It's just one way that we feel it really brings everyone to the table, you know, and to be fair, politicians like to be in front of the microphone. 
So let's put them in front of the microphone and let them talk. And Tim, you don't know what that's about, right? I mean, this thing is not the important this year. Lehigh Valley is in central to Pennsylvania. Right. Right. You know none of that, right? Right, right. So um, if you live in Pennsylvania, you hear this over and over, that there are three counties in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that went Obama, Obama, Trump. And one of those counties is where this backdrop behind me is located, Bethlehem uh, in Northampton County. So uh, we, we are absolutely in the thick of it. Um, and so we are very, very careful. Joshua, uh, the, 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 we, we echo those standards that uh, you know, your newsroom utilizes. You know, I would also suggest that uh, in our hiring practices, especially at the higher levels, we bring in folks that have 25 and 30 years of experience. They know what real journalism and being right down the middle uh, is all about. Um, in the same way, I'll use as an example, two years ago, when uh, many senators, uh, especially Republican senators, were having very difficult times with town halls. Uh, we hosted a town hall for Senator Toomey, uh, and we had been uh, you know, alerted by his staff to expect significant challenges. And, and so we worked with uh, the local police department to, to set up everything appropriately. The, there were protesters outside in front of the building, um, the, uh, it, and it, it was classic public media. It was civil discourse. The, the questions were, were difficult. Uh, for the senator. Uh, he handled them very, very well. We broadcast it live, uh, and it's exactly what we're supposed to do. Uh, so yes, we are uh, actively engaged. We, uh, we don't get a whole lot of pushback um, because we're, we're also relatively nascent. It's uh, two years uh, that, since we launched our reporter core, uh, but we are so concerned with the lack of uh, objective journalism in our greater community as the newspapers are uh, shutting down, uh, that we felt it was so important that we launch our own news uh, organization, first for television. Uh, we do a nightly news program, 30 minutes every night, and now we are uh, running a radio station and doing 16 newscasts uh, a day. So this is what we have to do for our community. It's what our community expects. Uh, and, and we will continue to do this going forward. And it's so important, right? This, this idea here that everything has to be polarized, we don't need to buy into it. We can say that as if we're going to be journalists or we're going to be public media professionals, our, no matter what our private uh, and individual political beliefs might be, our highest ideal is to give a fair um, exposure of information, of, of, of respecting all these differences and making sure that we're serving it. So Lindsay, in, in, in your state, you also, you have, you, have, you have no election stuff going on. I know it's not, a, <laughs> North Carolina is not perennially in the news as much as Pennsylvania, um, but you also have to ensure that, that these different views are given the kind of exposure that are required always with a, a fealty to truth and forthrightness, right? Absolutely. I strongly believe in uh, the, what the late great Gwen Eiffel said uh, about PBS, that it is our responsibility to bring light, not heat, to the issues of greatest concern. Um, and in our case, uh, the issues of greatest concern to North Carolinians. And I do believe we have a moral obligation to uh, be a unifying force in a deeply divided state. So we do have uh, public affairs programming and political opinion programming that uh, I will get, let's call it, I will get feedback uh, from, from both ends of the political yeah. spectrum, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and I do, because that means that we're representing both ends of the political spectrum and our support comes from both ends of the political spectrum. So we do have an obligation to represent all points of view and to reflect uh, the values and the commitments of the state of North Carolina and of North Carolinians. Uh, we've had, I think, um, I can't remember how many interviews we've conducted so far, but we've been, we have 30 minute interviews with candidates uh, it, from both parties um, up and down the ballot um, here, and then we're hosting the gubernatorial debate uh, in October. Uh, again, it's 
Uh, we've had interviews with people like John Bolton and our senators, and none of it has been sensationalist. We don't have people shouting at each other. We don't have people denigrating each other. You know, it's very civil discourse, and we get consistently positive feedback about um, transcending the, the the vitriol that is so common to our political dis discourse right now. I think it comes down to, is it more important to win a particular point or a particular perspective, or is it more important to do what's required to strengthen America that serves all people? And they're going to be different views. So if you're going to be in the latter camp, right, Tim, you, you, you kind of have to figure out what those views are, what those perspectives are, what those interests are. We just did a, did a poll and, um, and uh, the poll was really on, on where people thought that public media had its most distinctive uh, contribution. 80% of people roughly evenly split felt that uh, arts and entertainment on the one hand, uh, but also education on the other. And then there were some people who were interested in in news and politics and so on. But this, this idea of serving different interests, different educational interests, different arts interests, but also different, just different interests across the state is, is, is so much of a guiding light. And I would make the argument that news and information falls under our educational mis mission. You know, to your point, we provide the entire story so that you can make your intellectual decision based on having all of the facts as opposed to presenting the quote unquote winning perspective. That's, that is not what public media does, nor should it ever, and nor does it. Uh, so yeah, I, I, and arts and entertainment are always going to be an integral part of public media, uh, quite honestly, because we're the, the place that you go to find things that are not necessarily commercially viable. And therefore, our brethren on the commercial side won't air them because they can't uh, have advertising run against it. But we, on the other hand, will provide this so that you have that breadth of, of entertainment. And if you are a lover of opera, that you will, will see that or a, a lover of uh, some you know, uh, other types of music that don't necessarily generate uh, large commercial followings, uh, that is where you uh, go. And then, of course, we might have you know little little programs like Down Abbey that uh, uh, seem to uh, to gather some uh, some attention uh, and, and uh, you know make a, a significant change, especially you know right now when we are, we need to escape from being uh, consumed by our political coverage. Uh, you know, a couple of episodes of Down Abbey really do kind of bring the blood pressure down. So it's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. So I love your point about. Uh, even the news being about education, that perspective of transmitting uh, information. One of the things that we asked in the last poll was, uh, do you trust public media to provide straight factual information? And we, we said it um, as, as a question versus uh, commercial media. Uh, two thirds of the people thought that, that public media could be trusted more than commercial media, um, about a third uh, as much as commercial media, um, and, and a few people uh, felt that public media was less trustworthy than, than commercial media. So let's talk a little bit about the different, the disinformation age, and, and we'll go, uh, we'll have, uh, Joshua, Joshua, if you could uh, comment first, then Tim, and we'll end up with Lindsay, Lindsay giving, uh, giving Lindsay the final word. We're in a disinformation age. Right. People are constantly saying facts aren't facts. Um, uh, you know, doctors who are researchers and reach certain conclusions, we have to question the experts. We have to right. question what's coming out of different departments of the government. Uh, Climatologists, you know, it's, 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 ever, it's ever present. You know, the, the reality is that facts are facts. Uh, and, and that's what our business is built on, facts and perspective. Um, you know, you, you made the comment earlier, is it better to, to win or better to serve the country? I think our, at least at our station, but I do believe public media has a sort of shared idea that it's not ours to decide either. It's ours to make a case so that a listener or viewer can make a determination, do I need to win or do I need uh, an option that's better for the country? Um, you know, our goal in the, in the light, not heat, to borrow my, my colleagues, both of my colleagues uh, uh, saying that, you know, it is really to shine a light. 
um, and you shine a light on an item or an issue. And when you do that, you've got to bring everything into the light. There can't be any shadows, um, you know, and that goes for whether you want to call it facts and alternative facts that goes for whether you want to call it, you know, uh, you know, right and wrong or perception, but, but it is your duty to bring your, your expertise and your reasonable expectation of what the opposing side is to the conversation, you know, in our, in our newsroom and in our market, you know, we serve basically a, a, a pretty well-established kind of 50-50 split, if you want to just say red-blue, more, more or less. So the reality is that on any given issue, half the people might feel one way and half the people might feel the other way. So we tell our news folks, so consider that. Let's consider asking these questions from the point of view here, and let's consider asking the questions from the point of view here. And does that change how you're going to craft that conversation? I guarantee you in, in, in every instance it does, you know, use the Fox mentality and use the, you know, whoever on this side, you know, CNBC or, or MSNBC mentality. And let's find that middle ground that brings the most people in to understand both sides of the conversation. Um, yeah. And when you, when you continually do that, I think that you're able to hold yourself up as being fair and balanced. That's why your poll numbers look the way they do. And you have to grasp the fact that there is not just one perspective worthy of exposure, right? Right, right. Tim? It, absolutely. Now, and, and we have to take the tin hats, or, you know, the tinfoil caps <laughs> off. We, 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 we leave those out of the, uh, the conversation. But as, as we look at um, such as uh, racial diversity and the, the issues that have really surfaced uh, over the past summer, um, we have spent an awful lot of time uh, covering that both from a news perspective and from community conversations and, and, and the like, and doing our level best to engage because it is very multifaceted, the uh, talking points and discussion ideas uh, around this. Um, unfortunately, we happen to have a, um, a contingent of, uh, and I guess I'm giving away a bias here, but of, um, of, of the Klan uh, in our area. And so there are some significant challenges uh, as we uh, you know, go through these discussions. But we have, you know, it, and it was a, a question asked a, a bit earlier, you know, we have enhanced our programming around this topic so that we could be as inclusive of as many viewpoints as we possibly could, going so far as a new weekly program called Courageous Conversations uh, to uh, engage uh, multiple uh, constituencies around that. And so uh, race is always the third rail um, and uh, trying to deal with uh, issues of transformation when the personnel of media stations themselves need to transform, need to gain a more diversified perspective through lived experience. It means hiring differently, um, thinking differently. Lindsay, how are you confronting these kinds of, of issues that are so important to a strong America? You know, it's the, the media environment now, I think it, 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 people are through algorithms and all, you know, sorts of other devices people are basically viewing like they're like they're choosing a team right you're on team msnbc or team fox and you live in a particular you know or depending on how the algorithms shake out on facebook for you 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 live within a you know it's well known that you live within a certain information bubble uh where the news is sensationalized it's highlighting problems it's getting you angry it's making you depressed we are trying to stay focused right, right? Sorry? Making you click, right? Yes, click, click, right, click, click, right, click, right. And, and driving revenue, you know? Oh my through, God, I need, to, I need to see what yeah. what outrageous thing the next, you know, it's yes. ridiculous. Yes, uh, and it's not providing any solutions. So as we evolve and continue to develop our public affairs strategy, we are focused on programming that highlights solutions across the state. So it may be looking at uh, a problem that a particular community is facing in rural North Carolina and talking to an individual or an organization 
that is doing something to solve that problem or address that issue that would be scalable across the state and across the nation. Um, it's called solutions journalism. Uh, it's not new. Uh, it, is a, it is a movement which is taking root uh, and has strong support. And I do think that um, as we continue, as I said, as we continue to evolve and develop our public affairs strategy uh, without the benefit of a newsroom, um, I think that will be our continued area of focus. As we, uh, I, I always like to say, we are non-commercial and that means we are nonpartisan and we are non-toxic. You all That's a great are, way to say it. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? You, you, you all, I, I'm a total fanboy of, of, uh, of public media and, and not because public media parrots back to me uh, the positions that I already had. Um, public media has forced me to constantly rethink and constantly allow in my own life and our own work uh, voices that have different solutions that promise through collaboration and through discussion to, to evolve solutions that any one perspective was unable to alone develop, right? So that sort of mixing it up is, is so much a part of your mission. Lindsey Bierman of UNCTV in North Carolina, Tim Fallon of PBS 39 in Lehigh Valley, and Joshua Adams of Houston Public Media. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. That's the nonprofit report all. Everybody stay safe, mask up if you can, and, uh, and have a great day. We'll see you next Thursday. Thank you.